there's so many little rooms now with the happy pair. I forget that they have a. They're almost like little cubby holes. Um, you, you're actually you're actually quite uh, used to the happy pair. You've been here quite a few times. Oh, I come all the a, time. Ah. The, the the lads, um, David and Stephen, yeah. let Cormac and I, who are doing the yes, show yes, at the yeah. theatre, they let us um, rehearse down in the back garden, well that's ah, not a garden anymore, yes. down the back there for preparing to go to Edinburgh Festival. Oh that's sweet. Because we sweet. have nowhere, because he lives in Dublin and I'm down in Wicklow. Right. And we didn't have a middle <laughs> place to get together because he's always really busy Well this too. is a nice halfway home, you know, there's a nice yeah. kind of feeling here I think. Uh, I, I, I was, I, I, we were talking a little bit before with the camera's rolling and what I love about a lot of artists is that you get to a point where, you know, like Bowie did it with, with Black Star and I've seen Brian Ferry now kind of sampling his own early Roxy music work on a recent album where there's a kind of, it used to be, you, you, as an artist, you fought your earlier version because you want to move on, you want to reject, and you want to, don't want to be associated too much with an earlier uh, uh, in, in part of your life. But then there's that wonderful, also that wonderful kind of um, acceptance of saying, well, this is all part of me and this is part of my life. And I think for you, I don't know whether that's been a long journey of, 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 of having a huge amount of fame and, and all the crazy and the love and the joy that comes with that, and working all the way through to where you're content and you can... Feel, I don't know at peace with it or, or feel that it's I don't know uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> that's a long one sorry yes. that's a long one yes. That's a, yes. which bit of the question yeah. <laughs> no question I'll tell you what it, the good thing is in in a nutshell is that I arrived in Ireland right. in 1990 and it was a godsend hidden in a horrible event I, I was told right. I had a, a serious skin cancer two types on oh, my yeah. leg Right. And the minute she told me that in Los Angeles, the doctor, I said, right, I'm going to go and live in Ireland then. Because I'd always had this imagination that if I was ever told I had a horrible disease, I would never want to leave my body in a crappy place right. like Los Angeles. Right. Yes. And so I, and I thought, where would I want to die? If I, you know, I thought I was going <laughs> to die. I was just being over dramatic. Yeah, yeah. But in my head, I needed to be somewhere where... I imagined it would be a lovely place to leave my body and I'd always imagine right. a green hill and lovely blue sky and no rain of course. Hey! <laughs> yes, uh, on a day like today and right. I thought right that's it I'm going to go and live in Ireland and Louis Walsh used to be my agent in those ah, days. Right, right. So I phoned Louis and I said Louis I've got this terrible thing happened I've been told I've got cancer I don't want to live in Los Angeles anymore I hate it here anyway can you help? So he helped me find a mortgage. He helped me basically find a place to live. And I ended up coming over here. And from that, and also a few months later, the hospital phoned me in Ireland and said they'd made a mistake. Oh, so that's kind of a nice, yes. A yes. nice phone call. It was yeah. a nice phone call, but at the same time, it's like, ah. <laughs> because we was, I've always had dogs. So right. the dogs had been shipped over too, and we're living in uh, scariest because that's oh. they used to have to go to there and stay in the kennels, or kennels or the, for oh, six months, oh. quarantine. Right, right. So we do upheaved everything, mm. and they came here, and it was all not the illness I'd been told. So that was fine. Right. But from then on, hello. Hello, how are you? From, <laughs> okay. yeah. from then on, I guess I got into the Irish music structure slowly but surely. My marriage failed while I was here, okay. so I started going to a club in in Dublin called the International yeah. Songwriters Club, ah. where people like Glenn Hansard, Mundy. Right. Damien, Damien and Mundy were still just 19 year olds then, <laughs> and they hadn't done record deals or anything, they just had brilliant songs. Right. Uh, Glenn was doing this frames thing and you know, they'd had their moderate success and he'd been yeah. in already that film, you know, whatever it was. Once, once. yeah, yeah, oh, once. Sorry. No, yeah. before once. Oh, commitments. Um, yes, there we yes, go, there you commitments. Go. Yes, of course. And, uh, and it taught me at that point that acoustic music is fine that you don't have to worry because if you have a song whether the song is played with full kit and uh, electric bass mm. and the whole shaboodle or a, an orchestra or a um, string section yeah. or if it's just you and one instrument the song is what matters because people even if they're old songs they know the song sure. and in their head they will orchestrate that song oh, for yeah. you yeah, uh, and I do it when I go. I mean, if you just take Ed Sheeran for an example, yeah, that yeah. that lad, you know, can go and sing his songs, 
and nobody gives a shit whether he's with loads of people or yeah. on his own. And well, sometimes a widescreen, even though there's not much in there, you mean, and they, and they have that great kind of effect where you do, you know, you fill in all the gaps, and the gaps are actually beautiful. Yeah. That sense of space and and, and silence around the uh, uh, a heartbreaking vocal that can be uh, so so effective and yeah. even not in a technical way yeah. the other way is that you fill in the gaps because it's p if you're say somebody like me yes. who's given people the songs that they drop the hand to in this in the yeah. you know the show that night you yeah, know, yeah in the dance hall <laughs> and you know or they've made babies to songs like will you it's, yeah. they fill in those gaps as well because right. it's an audio an audio memory and that is something that's really, really wonderful and special to yeah. have, you know, to have is in my little carry bag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so good. when I met Cormac, we were doing something in Dublin, um, a Cuchulain cycle. Oh, right. Yes. And I was playing Queen Emer, and he was, uh, then he was like 21 in the, in the little band. First band. flush of youth, yes, there you go. <laughs> so I was just young yeah, myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and who was in there then? There was him and uh, what's his face? Oh, thingy from Oh Snoddy from Keela. Oh, okay. All right. his Ronan. Name. Uh, is it Ronan? The, the Ron main, uh, Ronan's the, the a nicely behaved right. person. The oh, naughtiest the behaved. Right. <laughs> I've forgotten his yeah. name because oh, he used yeah, to do mad things. Cormac, I'm not Cormac again. I'm trying to think no, because Cormac works with yes, yes. Um, culture. Yeah, I'll, I'll find it. I'll find it. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, well, I'll, I'll look at his police record. And yeah. uh, Colm McCumbra from okay. The Frames. So it's nice. a really lovely little orchestra and it was set in the RHA. And it was to, we had to yeah. move the scenes around the theatre. Right. And I had a dress that was about eight foot long. <laughs> so when we were used to practice and I had to put my frock on. Everybody, you know, everybody starts to play the music, <laughs> and and they've got their sandwiches and their this and their that on the floor. And I'd walk in for my first part, Yay. and I'd kind of gather newspapers and <laughs> and sandwiches and everything nice. below my skirts. But <laughs> the point is, that's where I made my first really serious friendships with class Irish musicians, right. like Colin. Colin did my first gigs with me, Cormac did some gigs with me in, I've forgotten what the even place was, after the International Bar, there was a place in Peter Street, Peter's Pub upstairs. Oh yeah, Peter's Pub, yeah. But I've forgotten what it was called. Right. It I used to Peter's have Pub a name right. and we did, okay. uh, I had two night, two shows in one night there, I thought oh, this will work because I was always selling out. Yeah. And the first show was sold out, second show was hardly anybody there. Huh. And I was paying everybody at the end with my checkbook and um, <laughs> and thinking, shit, right, I have right, right. money to pay for this. And right. um, and Cormac said, it's all right, Hayes. I don't want anything. You'll pay me back in time. Ah, that's sweet. And yeah, it was yeah. the first musician that's ever done that. And I'm not putting down any musicians because yeah, yeah, we all need to live on. Yeah, it's a natural instinct to survive and, and try yeah. to make a living from what you do and all that. And but uh, that's and that's how our relationship's been from then. And now he's in his forties. So. Two, two quick questions would be <laughs> what, if you could get a word but, yeah, but the Coventry thing now was there was there an Irish connection when you were growing up in Coventry yeah. I mean the idea that you had this Ireland in your head was that from a family connection oh my or? dad Ah, my right, dad's right. from Cladder in Galway well there you go how, how Irish can you get Cladder how Irish and, I mean a whole bunch <laughs> of them moved to Coventry but they right. went via the second world war Right. Because a lot of lads from the west of Ireland joined of up course, together, yes, kept trying yes, to join yeah, up. My dad yeah, yeah. kept trying, not right. because he was an Anglophile, right. the opposite. I mean, I think my granddad was, even yeah. though he was also in the British Army for a while in the Raj. Yeah. There's a lot of Irish that had to sort of, well, not once they had to, but they did sort of sign up. It was sort of the done thing that you were part of a, you signed up like going to work on the buildings, you, you, you would join the so, army, you know? Um, almost like, yeah. well, a great escape route to, yeah, for a 16 year old boy. Yeah, it was a, it was a boy, or something, you know? Just yeah, one of those things, from yeah. your mammy, you know? And, and, and my very long non question to start was just the fact that, you know, I know with Cormac now, you, 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 you've done, you know, the, uh, 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 the, 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 the stage play of Beyond Breaking Glass. You have, you know, Breaking Glass Barefoot is, is out now as an autobiography. So it was more that I was thinking that you've kind of, I suppose, you know, accepting the dress that, that, that it is a way in for a lot of people if they're thinking of Hazel O'Connor they think of that moment but of course you've had like a long beautiful career since then but I, I, I thought was there a, was that a struggle to, to accept and use that title again and say okay people know this and no never no, no. Okay. <laughs> oh my lord yeah yeah no, because when Cormac and I decided we'd do that Beyond Breaking Glass show 
Yeah. Um, because it was something I'd wanted to do because there's a bass player called Herbie Flowers. Oh, he's great, yeah. And Herbs used to always say to me, You've got to go to Edinburgh, Hayes. You've got to go to Edinburgh. He did, he did walk in the wild, so he got 25 euro, uh, 25 quid That's for that. That's right. Session. Yeah, because he did yeah. he did his own talkie show at Edinburgh. Right. And that, um, he was him that pushed me to write something because he knew I had lots of stories. And yeah. he said, Go to Edinburgh. And he fixed it for me. He was in a this particular theatre that year and he said Hayes you've got to go you've got to go I I'll talk to the guy so he pushed me into doing it so I got the place but we didn't have a show so then Cormac it was about 15 16 years ago or something like yeah, that. I think, yeah, longer, about, I think. Yeah, I think about 20. three years ago we did our 15th anniversary okay, there you it's about 18 so. years now yeah yeah but that's that's um it, it's, it's a kind of, as I say I, I think it's kind of uh, fascinating for an artist to you know in a way deal with your own kind of legacy but then hopefully that's the plan is always to be making something fresh and new out of that and yeah exactly yeah. because you don't want to just be doing well I, I didn't I didn't yeah. want to just be rehashing something I wanted yeah. to do it with panache and doing anything with Cormac Debarra is with <laughs> panache because that lad is amazing yeah, he's a stylish fake yeah he's really is he really is and and yeah. the fact that he you know he's another I could have been his mother sadly mm. but because he's such a consummate musician and he loves music, he already knew all my songs. Right. So right. when I, I I'd say to him, Cormac, <laughs> do you want to have a go at doing da 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 da, and it's on da 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 album? Right. And he go, oh yeah, I think I know that. Just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so the pair of us, he's always willing to take a risk more than anybody else I work with. Right. Well, Tony Visconti was always a right. risky person. Yeah, yeah. And Cormac Debarra is the other one. In fact, me, Tony, and Cormac did record in New York together ah, years nice. ago when we were doing the Beyond Breaking Glass album. Right, right. Um, but yeah, he's a he's he's a daredevil, and I like that, and I love accidents because I think accidents make something. Oh yeah, well, new beautiful happen. mistakes are the way to, to, to make yeah. great art. Often, I mean, the, the you know approach of almost putting yourself out of your your comfort zone, where you're not quite sure what's yeah. going to happen, is often the uh, most creative spark that you're going to find. I have yeah. a problem with that though sometimes because right. I also work with, besides Cormac, right, yeah. so I've got a coupling with Cormac, I also have a coupling or a tripling with two girls in England, one is Claire Hurst who used to be in the Bell Stars okay. and she ended right, up right. Uh, with Communards and David Bowie right. and the other one is an ex Eurythmic who right. plays piano so we have sax, piano and me and uh, the brief there was we do of course songs of mine but a lot of the songs that fit into a, a more jazzy bluesy idiom right right and those uh, those girls the two of them right claire's always willing to give it a go and claire and i have been friends since bell stars days in the right. 1982 we've played together we've gone to strange countries together to play in bands nice. but uh, sarah's more new to this concept well eight years we've yeah. been playing together now wow. and sometimes I give her a song and I say I really want to try this song for instance Chasing Cars yes. I say I really want to try Chasing Cars and I work it out at home first to say look I want to simplify it you know we don't need <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's this is how I think we can do it and she goes oh I'm not sure she goes <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> and I say no come on don't hey. be afraid and um, so we started to call her Jazz Hands <laughs> I think we've got a sitcom start up here. It sounds like it could be a, oh, a regular. It's hilarious. But now I don't get yeah. scared, and she doesn't get scared when I say we're going to try something here. And she goes, What, tonight? And I say, Have we not got a gig tonight? Uh, well, yeah, we, so should, we should mention too. I, so I'm just thinking back now that when you were 16, you left Coventry, you travelled. I mean, you went to France, you know, Beirut, Germany, West Africa. You really kind of went, went all around the world. And I'm wondering at that point in your life whether it was completely about just searching and no, fun or whether you had a plan about no it wasn't it was neither I was running oh, right I was raped when I was in uh, uh, okay. I was in Morocco with my friend and her older sister right on a little holiday in, in our summer holiday between fifth year at school and going back to do my sixth year and my A levels in England okay and uh, my f my friend and I were willful creatures mm. and we dumped her older sister who was our chaperone in Casablanca with right. the family that we were supposed to be staying with because her yeah, yeah, sister yeah. was an anthropologist and yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so we said we want to go to Marrakesh for a while on our own 
And so we talked her into letting us go and we went to Marrakesh. My friend got some illness and stayed in bed and I took um, an invitation to go to the King's Gardens with this fella that stayed in our um, hotel, right. pension. Okay. And he raped me, basically. And after that happened, uh, A, we left immediately. Mm. My friend went back to her sister in Casablanca and I went slightly right. loopy and I, I didn't even want to stay in Morocco and I hitchhiked, which is stupid, all the way up to Spain to where my ex-boyfriend was living in Ibiza right. and stayed there and then met the girls and went back to, to Coventry on the aeroplane, thinking I could suppress it, whatever it was that I was right. feeling. But when I got back to England and back to school, it just all seemed so stupid. Of course, right. I didn't tell of a soul, you know, nobody knew what had happened. I didn't tell my mum. I should have done. And was that, was it, I don't know what... Uh, and it was a reaction, definitely, to that. I just wanted right. to out. I didn't want to be... It just seemed stupid being at school now. I seemed stupid um, trying to go. And, and, but that kind of escape where you, you headed out on the road, I don't know whether... You know, music and, and, and becoming a star basically was another form of escape, or whether that was just a sweet thing that happened, or I don't know whether you, you felt that you were no. always dealing with it on some level. Actu or? Well, yes, I think I've always been dealing with it, or right. it, not even it, but it that allowed it to happen. Okay. The victim status, right. That right. which is more like it, you know, like feeling like you walk around with an invisible, but you can feel it burning into your forehead. Right. The, right. Um, no, I think when. You know, all the, the the initial running off, I wasn't unhappy. I loved my mom to bits. She was like my sister. Right. Uh, but I wanted not to be because I, I got myself into art college because I didn't like school, and I managed okay. with my portfolio to get into an early college where they'd let me go at sixteen to do my pre degree course. Right. right. And it was great for about yeah. three months, <laughs> but I didn't yeah. understand any of it. Um, so emotionally, I wasn't grown up enough. I wasn't even grown up enough to accept that, you know, if you were shagging one of your tutors, you got better grades. Stuff right. like that was all, it was like school, grown up world. Right. And it meant n nothing, really, that I could paint and draw. And and, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to think now, I know that uh, when it came to playing Kate in, in, in Breaking Glass, and it, it she was, was a nut at <laughs> Right, but that, that was a huge kind of, and often, you know, like when you think of. Uh, sometimes, especially musicians like Bowie, that acting, they're often close to their their off stage, or yeah. their off screen persona. It adds to the sense of who they are on screen. But uh, that was something you really, really kind of, were you ambitious? Were you looking for that, or, or were you just sort of? No, I wasn't. Right, right. I was not looking. All I wanted was to be married and ah, to be loved wow. and to right. have children. Right. Um, and when once I started the Runaway. March, let's mm. say, uh, and I went to live in Holland for a bit, and I was yeah. like, that was a dope. I know that was oh, my picture, oh. yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. being on Dan Square in a joint. <laughs> and then I, you know, reality hit that I had to have money to live on, so I started making clothes because I was good yeah, at that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I painted a picture. I, my idea was I was going to be in a, a garret painting pictures and being the artist nice. in Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah. The reality was I couldn't live, couldn't eat. And I started making clothes, and then I sold one picture to an American hippie traveler, and and he said, how much do you want for it? I said, I don't want money. I want a second hand hand machine, because I'd been doing everything by hand. Oh, wow. And so I got a sewing machine, and that's when I really went into business. Nice. Made loads of clothes. And then it was all over in Amsterdam, and I wanted to move on, and some people were saying, oh, Glastonbury's just happened and this young lad called Glu Guru Maraji Glu oh, Maraji, right, right, right. Guru Maraji yeah. and yeah. we're going to go and see him in Switzerland so I said alright I'll come as you did in those days yeah, so yeah. I went there and we never got there because the van broke down so <laughs> one of the lads had a friend that was a film star living in Paris and she sent us tickets to go live in Paris and I went there and that was fine and they all did street theatre and I was the panhandler but I wasn't happy. And the singing, was that something that was oh, always there? Oh, or no. That, sort of come in no, that was just, you know, sitting around a campfire singing, you know, Suzanne takes me down nice. to the face to the river. Um, no, none of it. My brother, however, by this time, had started m seriously doing music. Right. Because he was the one that got the piano bought for him when he was little. And I was the one that was jealous, going, oh, no. And my dad was the one that was could play piano by ear which always made me think he was doing this 
I couldn't understand that's it. That's Les Dawson, I think, does that, yeah. <laughs> does he really? Because that used to confuse me. Yeah, yeah. I just think, what are they on about? He's doing his, with his fingers. Hey. But uh, he, Neil got a piano bought for him. He carried on with music. When I eventually left the French commune, went back to England because I just wanted to be a good daughter. I was, right. you know, hallelujah. I'd had an epiphany. This was yeah. not for me. I got back to Coventry and my mum answered the door to me and I had henna red hair and uh, one of those Indian tea cloth dresses that I'd made. I looked at my old state and I was seeing pictures of myself and she looked at me and she said, bloody hell, she says, you can bugger up for a start. <laughs> she didn't want me. Wow. She did really want me but she was so hurt that I'd run off in well, the first place. Well you said you're sad that you've addressed this now. I know it's sadly in, in Christmas 2009 your, your mum passed Joyce and, and you wrote Rejoice yeah. about her and you felt that there was a kind of addressing the uh, your wild child years was important and, and, and it was obviously you wanted to celebrate it's a great title really just to sort of celebrate somebody who was deeply kind of rooted in your own life and your own uh, well, I'm, 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 I'm guessing yeah, I that you here. gradually I don't know, I don't know if you had, 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 had a good yeah, friendship with her as life went on or that was always like you were the wild child who'd sort of gone and like when fame and all that hit and, and I don't know whether that was a time when you could reconcile or I know I reconciled within you know the weeks of being told to book her up okay. <laughs> she just wouldn't let me live there again and right, I went to right. live at my grandma's again Okay. and right. uh, then I opened a shop in Coventry yeah, okay. right. a hippie right. shop <laughs> and then um, the partners in uh, working in that shop yeah. um, stole from our landlord ended up getting my shop closed right. and by now I'm 18 and my mum has bought me a sewing machine for my 18th birthday okay. for the shop and when we get to the shop with my new sewing machine, right. the cops are there, and, okay. and right. my landlord closed the shop. So that was the end of that. So then I go off and live in a commune in the north of England. My brother now has really joined the um, the new wave thing happening, and he's in he's 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 in a band called the Flies in Coventry. Say a quick hello to you. Are you all right? Hello there. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Yes. Hi. 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 <laughs> and uh, he he started a band with his his girlfriend's son because his girlfriend was like twenty years older than him. Okay. All right. And my mum had said to me when I got back from being away, I'd gone off to be a dancer in Japan and done all that stuff. Come back yeah. again, and my mum says your brother's living with an older woman. Oh. And I went. Oh. Your mum was having great fun at this time in her life. She was thinking, what oh, the hell is going on She was tearing her hair out. Holy and moly. I was expected to meet some the, really... Lucky guns are illegal in Coventry. I'm sure she wasn't <laughs> attempted. <laughs> and I thought I was going to meet some Hilda Ogden, you know, with rollers in her hair. Right, right. And we went to meet each other at, watch it, Clockwork Orange. Okay. And I, oh, and I was sitting and waiting in the yeah. cinema and I smelt this beautiful smell of patchouli coming past. And right. I looked up, and that was my brother's girlfriend. And I thought, Jesus! And she was beautiful. She was yeah. a beautiful woman. Yeah. But her son was nearly the same age as me. Okay. And him and my brother started a band. Nice. That boy uh, ended up writing uh, "No More I Love Yous." Okay. Wow. Which right. um, you know became yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, well, major, yeah. big yeah. money for him. Wow. And uh, he. But you're, I'm just amazed so, that so you didn't have this sort of ambition because no. most people assume that if you get to be successful, you, it was a burning, burning ambition no. that brought you there. No. My brother, he did yeah. everything, and then and then my boyfriend and I finally split up because I had this very long-term boyfriend that I wanted okay. to marry. He was the reason I ended up in Japan because he ah. said, "Go and earn your living and stop living off me and being a wow. And I took everything he said as gospel. Wow. So I went to Japan and then I went to Lebanon. Um, because my boyfriend had gone off to be in Australia and Africa and and wow. I thought I don't know what I'll do without him and then eventually we went to Africa together he told me he loved me and I should have been happily ever after but I'd gone off him by then because I was now 21 right and right. you know you change sure yeah and yeah that's when I went to see my brother's gig he was supporting the Buzzcocks he'd now made a record deal with EMI for about 90,000 quid and I was just like Ooh. and I have not been to any of these gigs because I'd nah. missed it all I'd been sure, even away yeah. Yeah. I, and it away was with all the hopping <laughs> the whole world was hopping and right. then with seeing the buzzcocks and then seeing my brother's band and all these people and the energy but the sense of DIY at that time was amazing too because you know that there had been up to the, the punk 
you know kind of breakthrough that that you just basically needed you know ten thousand keyboards and you know four drum kits yes. and all that and suddenly all you needed was you know sellotape and a string and, and a bit and of energy yeah, yeah and the women of the time the women of the time suddenly were no longer your judy zooks mm. your beautiful looking girls the West you, Coast, could, California you could have a big flake. fat nose and an ugly face uh, yeah. you could be fat you could be skinny it wasn't judged on your sexuality just right. for a little tiny minute in About time a week uh, yeah, late yeah. 1977 late really? yeah. and and for me it was so exciting i couldn't get enough of it once i'd seen what was going on i started to go out to see sex pistols the clash the, i remember going to see oh god what's his face him from ireland Bob Geldof? Yeah. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, the rats, yeah, I, and I, I fell in love with Bob Geldof. I thought he was lovely. I, yeah. I saw him in the in the marquee club and he gave me a badge and I thought, hey. oh, he loves me. <laughs> because he doesn't know oh, me yeah. from Adam. And I hold on to this badge and then I see that they're playing at uh, that place, Rainbow. And I pretended to be um, a telegram girl. Nice. And I took a little telegram in and thinking I was going to get to meet him and I put... Uh, uh, helmet on and said telegraph from Mr. Grimdor <laughs> and I went in and they said well just leave it here and I thought oh. so I left this picture that I'd made up which was a montage of, of him and I together nice <laughs> and I wrote this stupid that letter scare that won't scare him at all <laughs> well actually he, he told me years on that you know yeah. he's still got the letter which is oh, kind of wow, scary that's great. because you know he could blackmail me with it hey. but it said hey you know you should meet me before we both get too famous to meet Nice. Stupid nice. little girl. Anyway, um, he, he didn't send me a backstage pass. Wow. Well, he had that Jagger swagger for quite a while. You know, he was he had that frontman thing really down well. You know, you could sort of oh, see. Oh, he was there. great. He could hit a lot of people. I, with think, I still think he's great. I, yeah, yeah. I love seeing show. him. Yeah. Um, no, we should we should wrap up okay. by asking about the show itself. <laughs> the what, show. what should people what should people expect now? Because obviously you've got okay. a huge body of work to to play with. Yeah. So, I don't know whether you kind of have a, a sit down with Cormac and say, you know what, for this tour we're going to do the this or, or whether just you just play the songs. Oh, we've had a you. bit of a. Let, let me just see because okay. we you actually have the set list or? Well, we were playing up with Moya Brennan's dad, ah. Donegal, the other week. Right. And and you know such a long journey. Sure. And Cormac and I are not famous for our rehearsing. Now, when you're talking to Moya, can you ask him to make Enya stop? No, is there any way we could convince Enya to stop making records? Just just for a while. Even just to give us a break, because I know it's, it's terrific that she's so successful and she's a multi-billionaire, but just to give us a break, for like five year break, anything, just just so we could, you know, we don't have to live in fear that it might just happen, you know. Mm. Holy moly, that's it. Mean, well, anyway, yeah, yes, 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 Moya. Yes. <laughs> Moya, lovely. Moya, yes, yes. the beautiful Moya, who's yeah, yeah. been my mate since right. a long time now. And, uh, she wanted me to come up and play at Leo's, because she does the songwriters. Ambi well. Ambience Chasers, that's what they're called. <laughs> Yes, no, I've met I've met lots of people. I've lovely, got lovely people. I don't know. Anyway, well, Moya's to me, Moya's the the top, right. top notch right. because yeah, yeah. that woman has to work just like I have to work. Right. She's not one of the writers of Planad. She's the voice of Planad, Performer, which so has a very big difference in right. what your bank balance will sure, be. Sure, well, you're not you're not living off songwriting royalties nope. or, or you know those sort so of. So uh, Moya, uh, uh, Cormac works a lot. We we have a joke that Cormac's like her. Her husband and my husband hey, is a bigamist. There you go. A musical bigamy. But uh, he, him and I were trying to think what will we do. And I can't remember where I put it. That's a shame, isn't it? I don't know what we're going to do. Right. We'll, we'll probably but do. But it is that approach that you kind of let it happen that rather than you have any kind of a big blackboard and have to make a very specific plan, no. you kind of just let it happen that it's, we tend to it let should it feel, I guess, natural. Therefore, well, because we have yeah. so many, we have so much material yeah. now between us, um, and we've got the. Oh, I'm bummed out that I can't find the little list I made. Okay. I can't find it. Um, but well, we'll. Now you would include. I'm, I don't know whether you'd sort of include covers every now and again, or whether you're, oh, you're yes. kind of dealing oh, with your okay. own. Yeah. Okay, look. Huh. We will be doing Redemption Song because okay, we cover yes, Redemption yes. Song, and yes. we do an amazing. An amazing cover. You can have this if you oh, wish. Oh, sweet, yeah, that's But do you know what? Yeah. I've got to take. We might have to let Doodar over the road just take a screenshot of okay. it because he might have to make a poster or something for ah, the place. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Okay, but, but anyway, cool. but I did bring this for you, or for. Brilliant, right. Um, but no, we always do redemption song because that's another one of those songs. I said, 
I love it. And yeah, then I said, come on, Matt, do you think we could do a version with the harp and voice? And uh, he he's not like Sarah. He doesn't yeah, go yeah, like yeah. that. He goes, oh, all right, let's have a go. And we've worked out a version, and it really works. Yeah, yeah. So it's become well, a different. Those are almost like gospel. They, they can be really kind of so effective. You know, even taking you to the river, any of these sort of great oh. things that sort of have a, a gospel sensibility yeah. about them. All you need is that emotional kick, and that, you know everything else is just in the air. Yeah. Everything else yeah. is just set dressing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we w- we would do- we do a version of Skibbereen. We'll probably do that because we like yeah. doing that, but we haven't done it lately. We've got a new song that we've written because of uh, him in America, uh, Mr. Orange Face. Beautiful man. I'm just reading. Uh, <laughs> beautiful uh, actually, man. Just yesterday, there's a great line about him. When, you know, when, whenever whenever when he's finally marched out of Washington. You can be sure that he'll walk out of the out of the White House with his right arm held high. <laughs> he has that sort of feeling about it. He's unbelievable. He's unbelievable. a crazy man. He's yeah, a crazy yeah, man. But yeah. the song's called Wakey Wakey. Right. So if right. I give you this, you can have a listen to it because nice. it's about presidents, yeah. um, reality stars, presidents nice. in waiting. Uh, he's, he's, he's the, a combination of, of a lot of uh, bad kind of elements of popular culture that have been, you know, that have been brewing for a while. And it's an incredible uh, achievement. That Only in America. Yeah, a reality yeah. star becomes a, t- yeah, a, yeah. a TV star. So we've had movie stars before, so in a way, there's a kind of, you know, there's a... a yes, you know, there's a line when yeah, Reagan yeah. became... But it is celebrity-led now, more everything, politics and all that. But that's stuff. how he's le- That's how he yeah. thought he could do world politics. But yeah. well, we know the Flynn's are going to be the president of Ireland, joint president. We've had, you know, women presidents, we've had, uh, you know, gay presidents. I'm sure we will, we'll have, like, twins as presidents. It'll be just <laughs> another, another kind of, like, little feather in our cap. Um, so yeah, I look forward to the day David, Dave and Steve are yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It has a feeling it's going to happen. It has a, okay, yeah. so we'll do, yes. we always do the things like, uh, from Breaking Glass, always do right. Eighth Day, we always do yeah. Will You, always do If Only, right. always do Big Brother. Yeah. Uh, those are the always. We usually calls the tune. It'll be about six from Breaking Glass. And then we do a few from other albums of mine, like Who Will Care. Yeah. He's coming over to London for the big tour just right. to play Who Will Care with me okay. because he's got the day off. I should say, I see we're over 30 minutes now, so I better wrap oh. up. Is there, is there, is there, I know there's lots of them, but is there one song that, that re- really makes you break down and cry? Is there one song that you always think that, that that just is, you know, perfect in every way? Or is that hard when you've, you've got so many in your head? Yeah, it's too hard, really. I, I suppose when I, if me and Cormac ever do um, the Might and Hospice song, Rejoice, right. we both have a bit of a cry, so we tend okay. not to do that too often. Right. Because right. it's a bit difficult. Close to the bone. And yeah, you know, and, and my mum was like his second mum. Okay. Mum okay. would, you know, darn his uh, cover for his little harp when right. we were on the right. road. Sweet. Yeah. Sweet. Oh, well, I think uh, I think uh, it's going to be a show that people are going to be um, very excited about because it's. Uh, I think there's that. As I said, it's a, it's a bit like wine to me. Like you know, musicians who have been around, they tend to have a shorthand to, of emotion. They don't need to try so hard as when they're like fifteen and twenty and all that. And they really, really want you to like them. There's just a, a sense of this is what I do, and I've been here, and I and I, I, I just love that comfort of knowing. Somebody knows this world and, and it's just joyful. It's just a. That's what it. We yeah. will have a lot of joy together, yeah. myself and the audience, and Cormac and the audience. Yeah, yeah. Maybe Cormac's brother is going to join us for a few okay. songs. But we didn't want him to come and do the whole gig because this is a prelude to a tour that we're doing in England the following okay, week. So, oh, different right, and we okay. have to be. We, we have to remind ourselves to be brave, <laughs> do you know, to stand alone. Yeah. Because yeah. it, it does take, you do feel like you're naked yeah. sometimes. Well, you've got to step outside your comfort zone, so I think you should finish with Bohemian Rhapsody, just as a kind of an exercise. <laughs> just to see, yeah, just, just on the harp and the vocal, just to see how much of it, you know, or Freebird, Freebird would be good. If you can do, if you can do Freebird on the harp, we're laughing. 